It's odd, you know, says Miss Naomi Mitchison. One takes it as seriously as Mallory. And Mr. C.S. Lewis, also of Oxford, is able to top them all. If Ariosto, he ringingly writes, rivaled it in invention, in fact, he does not, he would still lack its heroic seriousness. Nor has America been behind. In the Saturday Review of Literature, a Mr. Lewis J. Hall, author of a book on civilization and foreign policy, answers as follows a lady who, lowering, he says, her pince-nez, has inquired what he finds in Tolkien. What, dear lady, does this invented world have to do with our own? You ask for its meaning, as you ask for the meaning of the Odyssey, of Genesis, or Faust? In a word? In a word, then, its meaning is heroism. It makes our own world, once more, heroic. What higher meaning than this is to be found in any literature? But if one goes from these eulogies to the book itself, one is likely to be let down, astonished, baffled. The reviewer has just read the whole thing aloud to his seven-year-old daughter, who has been through The Hobbit countless times, beginning it again the moment she has finished, and whose interest has been held by its more prolix successors. One is puzzled to know why the author should have supposed he was writing for adults. There are, to be sure, some details that are a little unpleasant for a children's book, but except when he is being pedantic and also boring the adult reader, there is little in The Lord of the Rings over the head of a seven-year-old child. It is essentially a children's book, a children's book which has somehow got out of hand, since instead of directing it at the juvenile market, the author has indulged himself in developing the fantasy for its own sake. And it ought to be said at this point, before emphasizing its inadequacies as literature, that Dr. Tolkien makes few claims for his fairy romance. In a statement prepared for his publishers, he has explained that he began it to muse himself as a philological game. Quote, the invention of languages is the foundation. The stories were made rather to provide a world for the languages than the reverse. I should have preferred to write it in Elvish, end quote. He has omitted, he says, in the printed book, a good deal of the philological part, quote, but there is a great deal of linguistic matter included or mythologically expressed in the book. It is to me, anyway, largely an essay in linguistic aesthetic, as I sometimes say to people who ask me, what is it all about? It is not about anything but itself. Certainly, it has no allegorical intentions, general, particular, or topical, moral, religious, or political. End quote. An overgrown fairy story, a philological curiosity. That is then what the Lord of the Rings really is. The pretentiousness is all on the part of Dr. Tolkien's infatuated admirers. And it is these pretensions that I would hear assail. Welcome. I'm Professor Rachel Fulton Brown, and this is The Forge of Tolkien. Do you recognize that review? Edmund Wilson's Ooh, Those Awful Orcs, published in The Nation in April 1956, only a year or so after The Lord of the Rings was published. It's one of the most famous reviews, and it's, it's interesting um, for a number of reasons. One, in that uh, Wilson goes out of his way to make sure that you know that Tolkien was a professor. I mean, he starts his review with, in 1937, Dr. J.R.R. Tolkien and Oxford Don, right? He's, he's horrified that um, someone who you know, teaches at Oxford, who is a professor, has published this children's book, which he says, well, okay, doctor, and interestingly that he keeps landing on that doctor because Tolkien never took a PhD. <laughs> he was awarded in 1954 to Delitz, one from um, Belgium and one from Dublin, um, but he never in fact held a PhD. He was a professor, which is a formal title in, in um, academia in, in Oxford and Cambridge, diff a little different from what we think of as professor in the United States, but he never actually held a PhD, and yet Wilson is absolutely going out of his way constantly to say, Dr. Tolkien, Dr. Tolkien, Dr. Tolkien, and Dr. Tolkien, I, I'm falling into my Americanisms quite powerfully here, <laughs> Dr. Tolkien, uh, you know, even he didn't claim that this was anything other than, well, just, you know, a, 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 um, a, an, es an essay in linguistic aesthetics. So you people who think he's so fantastic should just get a grip. <laughs>
Well, you might you might think, okay, so this was 1956, and it was immediately after The Lord of the Rings had come out. People had been expecting a, a sequel to The Hobbit, which is, of course, what Tolkien's publishers had asked him to provide. And Wilson is saying, well, that's what they got, right? My seven-year-old, who loves The Hobbit and loves The Lord of the Rings, even you know when I'm bored at reading it to her, she, you know, it's fine. It's a children's book, and that's that. Will you get a grip? Well, the critics have, in fact, never gotten over The Lord of the Rings. Um, L Wilson was writing in 1956, and since then, things have only gotten worse. I mean, Jermaine Greer is famous for saying at one point, and I forgot the date on that one, that, that you know, it was it was her nightmare that The Lord of the Rings would be, you know, considered a great work, and guess what? It was, and it has been proven so a number of times in the last um, 20 years. I ended up saying that there, there were a number of these polls that were done, particularly in, in Britain, saying, what's your favorite book? Um, one of these polls was, was mounted in um, 2004, 2003, 2004, by the BBC, BBC Two, um, asking its audience to vote our nation's best love book. And well, guess what? The Lord of the Rings won. And Richard Eyre um, wrote a little essay for The Guardian. He said, I have a number of things to show you this time both from the guardian and saying guardian readers clearly are not the the preferred audience for the lord of the rings if to judge from the essays that the guardian itself publishes and Iyer in his saturday january 17th 2004 meditation on the horrors of the bbc 2's little poll um d describes the lord of the rings as the war and peace of children's literature or somebody else did a commentator. The Lord of the Rings, that the Lord of the Rings won this ridiculous contest was no surprise. <laughs> After all, New Line Films has mounted a hugely effective marketing campaign for the book by making three films, the last of which is very good. Um, how, you know, it's like, one of the interesting things, of course, that happened with Peter Jackson's movies is the Lord of the Rings as a book got a whole new generation of readers and thus you know, the commentators had to come back out and tell us a number of times how silly the book was and yet people still kept voting for it as one of their favorite um, um, stories but as far as Ayer is concerned feeling churlish and and you know he says I resent being made to feel churlish and I feel ch felt churlish watching a parade of highly intelligent commentators humiliate themselves, just as BBC presenters, newsreaders, and weather people used to do in their annual Christmas TV pantomime in an effort to display their populist credentials and charitable hearts. Um, I'm not going to do that, Iyer is saying, because they've already embarrassed themselves by claiming that The Lord of the Rings is, you know, a good read. Um, and, and, and that's one of the things he says it definitely isn't. Um, one of the many paradoxes, he claims, of the popularity of The Lord of the Rings is that it's an extraordinarily difficult book to read. Wilson had said his seven-year-old found it quite, quite palatable, but Iyer says, no, 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 it's awful. If you leave aside the length, four books plus appendices, I'm not sure actually how he's counting, it's six, um, and are not repelled by the archness of the characterization, the brain-numbing complexity of the time scheme, the tedium of Frodo Baggins' journey from the Shire across the realms of Middle-earth inside the territories of the Dark Lord to the Crack of Doom, etc., etc., then you still have to possess an appetite for prose that is as inert and clogged as thick clay. Stick your spade in it and you never get out. This this is a, a, a common cr critique of the literary set that it, Tolkien's book is really awful and, and dreary and, and, and pedantic um, to read. That, that, that it's um, the style, we'll be talking more in future episodes about the style, but that this sense that they find it um, n not just aversive and boring, but, but clogging. Iner I mean, the inert, thick clay. It gets worse, though. Um, he he says, um, apparently they read it out, right? And so, on the night of the big read, Jim Naughty said there would be much rejoicing in Middle Earth. Middle Earth is a country inhabited by the people who voted Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, the best song in the millennium, and Star Wars, the best film of the decade. The faith of the Middle Earthers is perpetual childhood. 
Their currency is emotion on the cheap. Their epiphany was Princess Diana's funeral. Middle Earth is the kingdom of kitsch. And, and he goes on to, to describe this more. So it's the, the, the prose is like thick clay and cloggy, but it's worse. It's all cheap and fake. Kitsch is the junk food of art, all starch and no vitamins. It's not without sincerity. On the contrary, kitsch sincerely demands your endorsement. Camp is more attractive, aware of its pretense. It asks only for your knowing complicity, um, which is an interesting camp. He, he's, Iyer is fine with camp because even though it's bad, it's like that pantomime, the, the British pantomime um, tradition at, at, at Christmas is what he, he was referring to. And he sort of got that in his head. It's like, it would have been fine if, if, if we were able to laugh at it, right? But we're not allowed to laugh at the Lord of the Rings because everybody takes it so earnestly. It's so earnest and, and, um, the, the, what he thinks is as as cheap, right? This emotion on the cheap. Um, okay, back back to Iyer. Popular culture oscillates between the high kitsch of Lord of the Rings and the low camp of Kill Bill, the lava lamp of movie making. Popular entertainment will always avoid the real frailties and feelings of human beings. It will always fail to exalt the ways in which each individual differs from the next. It will always pretend that we're all part of some gloopy human soup. That's why we like it. That's why it's popular. Now, I think there's some a few very interesting things that he points to in, in this criticism. My one is he's okay with irony, right? And, and I think that that's incredibly important. He's okay with the camp. He's okay if you wink at it. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, say no more. It's all fine. Money Python reference. Um, but if you if you if you dare to in fact take heroism earnestly, if you dare to take Tolkien's loving descriptions of Middle Earth seriously, if you dare to look to some uplifting sense, okay, all of that. Obviously, I'm showing my preferences in in, in reading Tolkien, but. It, I'm, I'm wondering what it is that's bugging air so much. Kitchen sincerely demands your endorsement. Yes, Tolkien, you know, pre pretense that he might give to, oh, well, it was just an exercise. He obviously put his heart and soul into the story. When he published it, he said, I, I've exposed my heart to be shot at. Here are the arrows. I'm showing, sharing with you some of the arrows that people have shot at him. And what I'm wanting you to be wondering about and puzzling over is why. Why this vitriol against what, you know, Wilson would either say, well, it's just a kid's story and it's just bad. Or what I are saying, it's, it's you know, a bit popular, um, you know, it's a gloopy human soup and it's junk food. Well, our fairy stories mainly for children, right? And th that... Tolkien himself raised that question in the essay, they, the famous essay they wrote on fairy stories, and I'm going to be talking about um, when, as we're meditating on this. But let's let's think for a minute about well, are you actually okay with your desire to not just be inside the story, which we we've, we've talked about already, but maybe even go so far as to um participate in the kitschiness the the the, the um the, the movies you know it was actually only after the movies that you started getting a lot of the kitschiness but before that we did have things like calendars and um you know the desire to have the costumes now of course you can go buy the costumes for the, the characters in the movie you can buy figurines of them you can buy replica swords <laughs> you know is that a, a, a childish desire, as Iris is saying, to participate in this fakery, right? Um, certainly, you know, I think it's 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 a fair criticism that some have made those those soy boys that we all love to make fun of that get so excited about their new video games. Is that you know the gloopy human soup that we're participating in that no you know nobody actually has any real characteristics? You all just want to play role playing games and tabletop oh my goodness am i talking to the right audience right it's like is there is there a an appropriate anxiety about people's engagement with these stories that Iyer and, and wilson were pointing to saying these are basically they're 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 marketed as if 
they're for adults, but in fact, they should have been kept in this in the kids section. It's juvenile to be engaged in these stories. And by the way, the entire genre that these stories belong to, you know, fairy stories or fantasy or or you know, sci-fi and, and 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 fantasy, is in fact not for adults. Well what kind of literature do adults read? And I have one more review to set us up. Um, this one is um, also from The Guardian, but a few years prior um, in, in um, September 2000, when Andrew Rissick was reviewing Tom Shippey's Author of the Century, uh, J.R. Tolkien, Author of the Century. And Shippey, I mentioned him before, he's a great scholar of Old English and has wrote a pair of books, The Road to Middle Earth and The Author of the Century, in which he, he tries to demonstrate the complexity of Tolkien's work as a scholar, right? As in the, the phil Shippey himself can do the philology, so he can do the, the study of the languages. He's actually held some of the same um, uh, academic positions that Tolkien did in Leeds and, and Oxford. And he is, actually, I always do this. You know I do this. I'm talking and then I say something and I'm like, oh goodness. Okay, so this is this is the book. And yes, Shippy did teach in Oxford. I've met him at Kalamazoo at the, the Medievalists um, International Medieval Congress. And so my, my in my head, Shippy's just at Kalamazoo where he often presents... Um, with the Tolkien panels, you know, there's a number of professors that present on Tolkien. Well, so Shippey, in writing these books, here's his other one. I'll get a great cascade of books. In, in writing these books, try to demonstrate that Tolkien was, in fact, worthy of our attention, both as an author of great, great literature and as a scholar cognizant of the problems that he brought to the composition of the literature. Well, Andrew Rissick in The Guardian, September 2000, well, I have nothing of this. He said, oh my goodness, here we go again. J.R.R. Tolkien's chief contribution to the literature of the 20th century was to ignore it almost completely. This is actually true, right? Tolkien was quite overt about how much he disliked everything that was being published in his own lifetime. And so he and C.S. Lewis and, and their friends set out to write the kind of stuff they like to read, right? So Tolkien seems to have not ter paid terrifically much attention to what we would now call modernist literature, right? And as far as Rick is concerned, okay, so it, 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 it's, a per it's sort of perverse to try to claim that Tolkien is the great author of the 20th century when he doesn't seem to have participated in that literary conversation at all, right? Uh, back to Rissick. He wrote, as his Oxford Don colleague and fellow inkling C.S. Lewis also did, to retrieve something that the discordance of the modern age seemed intrinsically to threaten, the old, secure, pre-pubertal pre moral certainties of late Edwardian England. Now, that's a very interesting pre-pubertal, right? Again, childish. You'll have recognized that this is happening over and over and over again. Edmund Wilson saying, it's a children's book. Here, Richard Eyer is saying... Um, that the faith of the Middle Earthers is perpetual childhood. And here's Rissick again saying what Tolkien did was, you know, long for the pre-pubertal, the, the moral certainties you have as a child, which then he's saying Lewis and Tolkien projected onto um, late Edwardian England, which would be when they were growing up. So that, you know, basically all they were doing was trying to be boys again and recover the moral certainties that they'd had um, before sex. Right, carrying on with Riss with Rissick, both men were secular mystics who chose to canonize their own tastes, as if th that's a bad thing. But anyway, they found in books and mythology less a reflection of life and lived experience than some fulfillment of the mind's sovereign capacity to escape into dream. Fair enough, but with an edge, right? It's like yes, dream. But we're, again, we're going to talk about that. I am promising a lot, and I do promise we'll get to all of this in, in the videos. I'm just tempting you <laughs> to keep listening. Um, Lewis might have been happier if English poetry had ended with John Maysfield. Tolkien would have preferred it to have finished somewhere between the work of the anonymous Gawain poet, the author of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, whom he translated, and Chaucer. Literature stops in 1100, he once said. After that, it's only books. I approve of <laughs> that sentiment, right? It's like when I try to think about what literature... Do I prefer reading? And people say, what poetry do you like? What literature do you like? It's like, I get why Tolkien had 
the desire to create something with the atmosphere, the air of Old English, right? There's something radically different about the literature written prior to 1100, prior to 1066, when the Normans came in and wiped out that literary culture, right? Um, although Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Pearl and Sir Orfeo, which Tolkien also um, translated and which we'll be talking about, you see how much there is about Tolkien that maybe you didn't know yet? Um, those are also great, great poems, um, these, this Middle English alliterative poetry, but both Tolkien and Lewis felt like there's something radical missing in modern literature and we'd like to tap into that, whatever it was that was lost. And Rissick and Wilson and Iyer all managed to say, well, that's childish, right? Longing for that something is simply, you don't know enough about sex. It was as if, Rissick again, on some primary level, his interests weren't artistic at all. I don't know why he says that, but anyway. He abandoned Greek and the classical world after an indolent first year at Oxford switching to English and linguistics because compared to philology was the only paper in which he distinguished himself. This is the sort of cattiness is amazing, right? It's like Rizik saying you know, Tolkien shifted to philology because he'd only, you know, that was the only thing he was any good at. Well, in fact, it was of course what he knew he was always most committed to. And at the time when he was at Oxford, the classics still had the, the prestige, right? They're, they're being chipped away at right now as we speak, because of course, dead white males. But at the time, Old English didn't have the sort of um, stature that, ironically, his professorships managed to give it, right, because of his great work on Beowulf and, 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 and other Old English texts. And so switching from the classics to English was a step down, right? That not only did he not have a PhD, he, he studied the, the the sort of lesser languages and philology. Tolkien was also engaged over the course of his career, and if, if you want to know this in detail, Shippy, go back to, to Ship, Shippy is great, on um, Tolkien's struggles with his own academic colleagues over the place of philology in the, the, the degree, right? And here Rissick is, is playing these games at saying um, Tolkien, he was lazy, indolent first year, um, he switched to English and to um, linguistics because he hadn't done really terrifically well in the classics. And, you know, then this is a problem. The, the sense of whether or not Tolkien wasted his career writing what we love to read. And if, if you look at his, his actual publication list, he, he didn't publish that much as an academic. He wrote a lot and he wrote interesting lots and lots and lots of poetry which we also want to be talking about more. But he he didn't do the intellectual scholarly work that he was actually hired to do as Rawlinson Professor of Anglo-Saxon. Um, and Rissick is trying to figure out why, right? He's just in this sort of um, psychoanalysis of what it was that Lewis and, and Tolkien were actually trying to avoid. Um, one suspects Here's Rissick again. One suspects that the undertow of sex and religious doubt and the restless argumentative probing of human psychology in Euripides, Aeschylus, and Homer held little appeal for him. Now that's interesting, saying, okay, so the reason Tolkien switches from classics to Old English is he, he can't deal with the sex bit and religious doubt. Now you start getting, it's like the people start revealing themselves eventually or like overtly, accidentally right on the page. As far as Rissick's concerned, the reason Tolkien wanted to study Old English and philology was he couldn't cope with sex and doubt and religious doubt. What he liked was the color and vitality of archaic Northern languages, their hammer on anvil, gold and silver sound, their plainness and lack of introversion. Now, all of that is so fascinating, right? The, the archaic Northern languages, you know, heroism, you could say, the sort of feel and atmosphere that Tolkien said he wanted from um, the stories, but also from the phonemes. We've, we've talked about that already. Uh, the hammer and gold on anvil, gold and silver sound. Now that is perceptive of Rissick because we've talked about the way in which Tolkien imagined himself, um, you know, sort of tasting and, and, and hearing the languages first, right? So there is a musical quality to the languages, um, but their plainness and lack of introversion. That's so interesting to claim that pre-modern 
literature doesn't care about the soul. You do know what the root of psychology is, right? It's the logos of psyche. And it, it's, it's, it's a constant sort of refrain in modernist criticism to pretend that sex was only discovered in the 19th century. Who knows? The danger in writing about him now is to misread this essential simplicity of temperament. He's constantly trying to, to make Tolkien simple, simple, simple. Um, and he, th what's interesting, this isn't completely a hostile review, right? Um, he's saying, Shippy wants to feel his own enthusiasm, which is for morally serious fantasy, the kind t Tolkien pioneered, is worthy of a place up there at the table alongside the totemic great names of the Western canon. Accordingly, he classifies Tolkien as equal with or ahead of James Joyce, George Orwell, William Golding, and Kurt Vonnegut, and then castigates the literary snobs who disagree. Well, you should castigate them and wonder, it is, you know, Shippy chose his comparons fairly carefully. Joyce, Orwell, Golding, and Vonnegut, right? There's a fantasy element to much of the literature that came out of the generation, not of World War II, although they're writing around World War II, but the ones who survived the Great War, right? That, that there's something about the cataclysm that Europe went through in the Great War just over 100 years ago that is deeply embedded in the literature of the 20th century. And Shippey's contention is Tolkien participates in that. Um, and he's trying to make the case for that. But Rissett goes on saying, you know, but it's not just literary snobs, he says, who don't accept Tolkien as one of the greatest writers of the last century. Almost no one does, except the hardcore Tolkien addicts who've elevated his books to the status of a cult. Again, constant, constant, constant. It's like those of us who like, I'm assuming if you're watching this, you like Tolkien. Those of us who like Tolkien are in Ayer's terms, um, you know, worshippers of kitsch. In um, Rissick's terms, well, we, we're just addicts and we've, we've elevated his books to the status of a cult. This is before the, the movies came out, this essay. Um, and we're incapable of proper um, literary appreciation to understand why Tolkien is nothing like a great author. Um, Okay, so, and then Rissick will say, okay, so it's popular, but he, he says, I doubt whether popularity has any significance, which is, again, interesting. Are we just jealous that Tolkien's work sold well? Eventually. He says, Rissick, people read the tales of Middle Earth the way they've always read cunningly wrought fantasies, the way they read Sherlock Holmes or James Bond or Dracula, drinking in the excitement of the atmosphere, reveling in the hypnotic detail. He, he doesn't think it's clogging and, and boring like um, Iyer did, but saying the reverse, it's it hypnotic. If you get critic critics that are you know um, convinced in their criticism, but in opposite poles of what they say is wrong, that that's an interesting clue to what's happening. Um, he says, uh, the, the, you know, people who don't read the Tales of Middle-earth, they don't read them the way the 19th century public read Nicholas Nickleby or War and Peace, feeling that these books were somehow inseparable from the life and thought of their age. So here we get to, I, I started reading this essay um, with the question of what is it that adults actually do read? And Rissick is trying to tell you, right, that Lewis and Tolkien just write prepubescent fantasies and they want simplicity and they don't want the undertow of sex and they don't want religious doubt and you know morally serious fantasy you can you start getting the sense okay what is it that adults read well it's this absence of common literary horse sense that makes me feel that a critic who tries to raise the creation of hobbits in middle earth above what was achieved by yeats Eliot, conrad joyce dh lawrence or auden footnote, Auden actually liked The Lord of the Rings, is either artistically tone deaf or harmlessly dotty. After the annihilating traumas of the last century, it's merely perverse to ascribe greatness to this airy but strangely simplified mock Teutonic Never Never Land, where races and species intermingle at will and great battles are fought, but there's never any remotely convincing treatment of those fundamental human concerns through which all societies ultimately define themselves. 
religion, philosophy, politics, and the conduct of sexual relationships. And you know, at which point in my notes, I basically say, okay, so I, I will read porn. What? That the, over and over and over again, what Rissick is contending is prepubescent, childish, simple. Tolkien and Lewis were afraid of sex. You know how many children Tolkien had? And his you know, comments about marriage are very, very important and significant. We will get to those as well. But the, the reviewers constantly claim that what Tolkien doesn't give them enough of is sex. Um, and they perpetually accuse him of not taking the real horrors of the war, of politics, of, you know, temptation, any of the things that adults have to wrestle with. Seriously, they say he's, you know, it's simple. Um, there's this, this, um, and there's no doubt. And somehow the, these have no reference to like reality, right? That you want, you want it all to be realistic and not somewhere in this never, never land. Again, that, that's an interesting thing. Um, saying and, and and recognize that what Rizik is doing here is he's criticizing Shippy for trying to say that Tolkien actually takes on real issues of you know what happened to the civilization after the Great War, although Tolkien perpetually insisted that he was not writing an allegory, but clearly, you know, if you know of the way it's described how Sam and Frodo go through mortar, there's trench warfare there, right? But the the the, the critics don't want to say that that is what Tolkien actually achieved. They perpetually revert to um, right. This this is the style. I was thinking about this just a second ago. This this problem with Tolkien's style never rises above children's books story, right? Loose, and Wilson had said that too. That um, he you know seven year old could understand it. Um, Tolkien lacked the qualities that might have made the Lord of the Rings a masterpiece the language of a poet and the perception of a philosopher. When at the end of Mort Arthur, Sir Ector enters joyous guard to find his comrade, Sir Lancelot, lying dead, we hear in the spontaneity and simple stoicism of his grief, some of the finest dramatic speech written in English before Shakespeare. When in the last pages of the Lord of the Rings, Frodo leaves the Shire and departs for the Grey Havens, all we hear in the suavely allegorical and too sweetly cadenced prose are plagiaristic echoes of other books, other voices, Mallory, Tennyson, Andrew Lang, William Morris, the King James Bible. Yet the moment itself, in its higher aspiring style, quote, and it seemed to him that as in his dream in the House of Bombadil, the gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise, lie at the heart of what Tolkien and Lewis were striving to achieve. Their visions for all its limits was not ignoble. Some faith that had been lost amid the slaughter of 1914-18 is respected in their fiction. Both were devoutly religious. And for both, life was largely an intensification of what they'd read and talked about and imagined. Both locate their image of God in the same emotional places, in the sensuous, pre-industrial beauty of an invented natural world and the childlike stillness of the accepting human mind. The tone is lyrical, the meaning apocalyptic. Tolkien's Middle Earth and Lewis's Narnia were what these men thought and hoped that heaven might be like. Right, so now do we know what it is that children are supposed to be reading? Well, apparently they get to read stories about heaven, which is, is lovely, but there's there's a this this um, perpetual insistence that the Lord of the Rings is childlike because it draws on ideals of heroism. It's childlike because it, you know, the opposite of, of camp, it doesn't wink at itself. It, it, it wants you to engage in the world. It wants you to be absorbed in the world. And um, because there is this, this um, in fact, religious quality to the descriptions that Tolkien and Lewis gave. And as far as all of these 
oh-so-modernist reviewers consider it, well, that is that makes it a, a book childlike. Now, we can think about that for a second. <laughs> Tolkien, of course, insisted over and over and over again that he was not writing for children. And you can imagine how frustrating he found these claims that, well, this is just a children's book, this is just a children's book, this is just a book, including when, in fact, his own admirers <laughs> asked him to talk about children's literature. And he was, he was invited at one point to contribute um, this is an invitation that came in 1959, so a few years after The Lord of the Rings is published. He was invited to contribute um, by Walter Allen to a children's book supplement of The New Statesman. And he was told, quote, the kinds of questions we should hope you would consider are, how far do you write with a specific audience in mind? I.e., how, how do you feel writing for children differs from writing for adult readers? Assuming that he's starting from the... A, a writing for children problem. To what extent do you feel that writing for children satisfies a need in yourself? For example, by expressing a side of you y you repressed in ordinary life or by the exigencies of writing for adults? How do you see the relation between The Hobbit and The Fellowship of the Ring? Are you conscious of a didactic purpose? And if so, how do you construe it? Now, Tolkien, uh, what's hilarious, uh, this is letter 215, and it, it's it's delightful because it's draft and it was it was never sent. Um, all Mr. Allen got was, I very much regret that it seems impossible for me to take part in the symposium that you propose. I've only recently returned from convalescence after an operation. I'm faced with much neglected work. Term begins next week, and I shall not have time to produce any copy before April 19th, so I, know I can't do it. But he had tried and he drafted some some answers to what Alan had asked him to do. And uh, I mean, first he tried to say first, I, actually, it's all an apology. And he, he wrote this long winded apology. I'm not going to be a term. I have said all that I wanted to say about this in on fairy stories. And so I don't really want to go on. I don't, in fact, care about writing for children. Right. And this is, you know, amusing in, in a sense in that Tolkien did write for children. He wrote for children all the time, and he wrote very specially, for example, for his own children, um, the letters from Father Christmas, um, and he also wrote um, things like Rogue Random, uh, again, for his own children. So it's it's not like he, he hated writing for children, but people kept wanting what he had put his his heart into the lord of the rings and and the silmarillion oh well it's it's really for children it's really for children it's really for children isn't it and we've seen how the reviewers kept doing that even once he managed to publish it um he's saying well you know even when i published the hobbit i i didn't like that uh i kind of fell into some sort of twee kind of he doesn't say twee he says i i um the desire to address children as such had nothing to do with the story as such in itself or the urge to write it. This was The Hobbit. But it had some unfortunate effects on the mode of expression and narrative method, which if I had not been rushed, I should have corrected. <laughs> Intelligent children caught all of that, right? And and it in fact, it's one of the things that I always disliked about The Hobbit. There's a few moments in The Lord of the Rings where the, the well, you recognize that Bilbo here is, you know, doing something that, a, you know, a, a good, a grown-up person wouldn't do that kills the story and Tolkien was quite right to be to like cringe at those moments but it's interesting because even though he, they're not really very many of them and there's only one or two at the very beginning of the Lord of the Rings the reviewers persistently say that those should have you know that they probably would have preferred him to keep winking at his audience that way right even to the children right wink at the children say you know that hobbits don't, aren't, you know, really like this, or you, you know, you would know what to say to a dragon, but, you know, Bilbo didn't have any experience at it. That kind of, of, of twee sort of, uh, I've used that word several times now, that kind of adult condescension and, uh, you know, getting the children to agree with, that we're all being kind of silly here. It, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons I absolutely despise most children's television because it is so like, oh, boys and girls, we're going to do this today. And I, I mean, 
okay, I'm a woman. Am I supposed to like that kind of thing? I despise it, right? I, the only children's show I ever thought was kind of funny was, was as an adult, the Pee Wee Herman send up. And then now I realize you know, there's a lot of problems with Pee Wee Herman. It's like, are there people <laughs> able to do things that they think of consciously for children that aren't, in fact, doing something rather evil? Right. Well, Tolkien insisted he never was. Um, that he says, I'm not specially interested in children and certainly not in writing for them, i.e. in addressing directly and expressly those who cannot understand adult language. That for him was, and, and in fairy stories, he talks a little bit about, you guys are just going to have to get used to me doing this. Um, he talks a little bit about things that he finds really frustrating with this presumption that fairy stories were written for children and one of them the, the thing that he he reverts to over and over and over again is that you know things that are quote adapted for children by taking all the difficult quote difficult words out um in, in another letter hold your hold your finger at 215 we're going to go over to a letter um 234 that he wrote to his aunt jane neve um and he, he talks specifically about how it's dumbing down books for children that destroys the vocabulary. I think this writing down, flattening Bible and basic English attitude is responsible for the fact that so many older children and younger people have little respect and no love for words and very limited vocabularies. And alas, little desire left, even when they had the gift which has been stultified to refine or enlarge them. Tolkien hated I mean, this, is a, this is at the philological level of why he he hates the idea of writing for children, but he hated the idea that you dumb down the vocabulary to make it more appealing for children. So it's it's very interesting that that is what people like Wilson assume he was doing. You know, Wilson says that you know the seven year old can understand all the words, and um, Iyer claims that the, the prose is like you know clay that you get stick a spade in and you never get out. Tolkien as a philologist was hyper aware of the vocabulary that he was choosing and he would have never been choosing it simply to make it simpler. So if it strikes us as simple we need to consider what that what that actually means, what kind of complexity it is that we would prefer. But Tolkien despised the idea that you write for children by dumbing everything down and that if you do that, he's saying to his aunt, you just end up with people who have no love for words. They have no love for the, the, the richness of the vocabulary of English and they have no ability, if, if you don't catch them when they're younger, to build up their vocabularies because it's in fact when you're young that you best learn all of those wonderful rich words. Right. Um, he says again, and this this is to Walter Allen, this draft of his refusal to write about children's literature. I write things that might be classified as fairy stories, not because I wish to address children who qua children. I do not believe to be specially interested in this kind of fiction, but because I wish to write this kind of story and no other. OK, so here are two things that he's claimed. One, children's literature doesn't doesn't mean please don't write children's book thinking that the best thing you can do is get rid of all the fancy words because that just you're ruining the opportunity to help them build up their love of of the language itself but two i don't think children are that interested in fairy stories now that th that is particularly very very interesting and that was the long argument that he made um in his in his essay on fairy stories saying that there's this there's an aside that he gives um about how frustrating he found it that this genre of literature which he himself was sort of moving the borders around as he was as he and lewis were working but this genre of literature that was called fairy stories was considered most appropriate for children and and the image that he used as well it, it it's not so much that the stories were originally written for children because they weren't. It's just that they kind of got pushed up into the attic with all the stuff that we've now forgotten and are, are no longer 
um, considering. And so when Andrew Lang came along with his multiple series of colored fairy books, starting with the red fairy book, um, that he pitched them at children was, a, you know, sort of, you could say it's, it's kind of a publishing um, ploy, but it was also a distortion of what the stories actually were because and, and Tolkien saying this, that he didn't, he didn't grow up wanting fairy stories. He did get the green fairy book. He says, I was born about at the same time as the green fairy book. Um, and so it should have been addressed to me and I should have liked it as a child. Um, but in fact, I didn't really want to read fairy stories when I was a child. I wanted to read all sorts of other things. And he, he gives a list of um, other things that he was much more interested in. Um, I didn't read them in the nursery, right? These weren't nursery stories for me. A real taste for them were work after nursery days and after the years, few but long seeming between learning to read and going to school. I didn't, Tolkien is saying, I didn't want fairy stories when I was a child. I wanted history and astronomy, and botany, and grammar and etymology. Now, consider these two things actually fit together, right? He's, he's frustrated that the idea that you have to write um, down to children, particularly by taking out the, 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 the difficult vocabulary, never mind the, the difficult problems. Um, and he's saying what I wanted to do when I was a child was learn stuff, like actual real stuff, facts, facts. This, in, in fact, it fits, it fits beautifully with an essay that Dorothy Sayers wrote. Um, some of you may be familiar with this if you're particularly homeschoolers. <laughs> um, called The Lost Tools of Learning, where she's talking about the importance of the language arts, the importance of the trivium, and the importance of this old style. It's a little bit projected and imaginary, and I do a whole course at the University of Chicago on it, trivium, the educational program of the Middle Ages. But she's right, I think, in her description of the way grammar, um, rhetoric, and logic, her, her, her order, grammar, logic, and rhetoric actually fit together. And saying that there are particular ages at which it's appropriate to um, immerse the children in these, these different modes, right? And grammar is learning learning names, right? Grammar, if you, if you think about it as learning the, the vowels and the consonants and the syllables and then the parts of speech, all of this goes back to antiquity, right? The great um, grammarians, Donatus and Priscian, and those were studied in the Middle Ages. But you learn the parts of speech and you learn the structure of sentences and you learn lots and lots and lots of vocabulary. And that's exactly what Tolkien is saying he wished he wanted, and he he sees children as being drawn to give them lots and lots and lots and lots of reality, right? Words. He wanted um, history, stories, factual stories. He wanted astronomy. He wanted to know what the stars were. Name them all, right? Um, botany. Name all the plants. Grammar. Name the parts of speech. Name all the name all the things. Name all the things. Etymology. Understand the the history of uh, the names of all the things. That's what you do when you're. It Sayers um, puts it like seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. You love, love, love memorizing stuff because it's filling you with. You know, we say factual knowledge. It's it's actually extremely important now. This you know, so want to say, what are we doing to our children now in their education? Not only are we telling them stories that are probably grooming them, and that you knew I was going there eventually <laughs> for evil. We're not filling their their they, them with the resources that they're going to need to actually do the imaginative work that we imagine that children are doing because what they want is to know truth. Then Sayers says, you know, they get they, they get to age middle school, they're about, you know, 11, 12, 13 or something. They just want to argue everything, right? Then she says that's when you start teaching the logic because they do want to argue. They've, they've filled up their, their um, memory. They've filled up their memory stores with a sufficient number of, of facts. And now they want to test things and argue things and, you know, they, they test propositions and stuff. Then you give them dialectic and let them argue out. And she says it's actually only at the age when we would think of sort of high school that you get to rhetoric and persuasive speech and, you know, crafting poems and beautiful, beautiful 
artistic speech, which um, I, I, I think you actually need poetry younger I think the nursery rhymes and, and so forth and rhyme and sound and all of that. You actually need poetry from the very beginning. But the crafting of persuasive speech, actually imaginative, getting in, you know, think about what the imagination is. It's getting inside the perspective of somebody else, right? Put on a character, you're going to imagine yourself being able to see the world from that perspective and be able to tell that, that that kind of exercise of, um, I guess in psych speak, it would be theory of mind, but that, that sort of what you need to be able to use in order to, in rhetorical terms, win someone's goodwill, she says that that you're going to need to be, you know, get through the naming phase and the argumentative phase before you get to the persuasive phase and understand how psychologically effective um, you can be with different forms of speech and, and so forth. Tolkien, I think, would agree with all that because he's saying, you know, he wanted to know. He did desire dragons, right? He says, fantasy or the making of glimpsing of other worlds was the heart of the desire fairy. I desired dragons with a profound desire. Of course, I didn't really want the dragons around, um, but I, I, you know, did want dragons. But on the other hand, what I mainly wanted was facts. And that that, Tolkien is saying, is what children actually mean when they, when you're reading them a fantasy story and they're like, is this real? Is it real? Is it real? I mean, they want to know whether it's real, right? That's actually the question that they're asking. It's like, is, is, are there really dragons? Why would they know? I mean, maybe you've taken the zoo and they're running dragons there, but they are testing the boundaries of reality. And, you know, when you're at, they're asking, you know, is daddy going to be okay? Is mommy, is mommy coming home now? They want to know facts, right? And they want to know, therefore, and he, what Tolkien says about the, the dragons, right? Of course, I and my timid body did not wish to have them in the neighborhood intruding into my relatively safe world in which it was, for instance, possible to read stories in peace of mind free from fear. Um, and he footnotes, this is naturally often enough what children mean when they ask, is it true? They mean, I like this, but is it contemporary? Am I safe in my bed? The answer, there is certainly no dragon in England today is all they want to hear. They want to know the boundaries between reality and make-believe. Not that they, in fact, want to live all the time in make-believe. It therefore may interest you to hear that Tolkien absolutely, as he says, heartily, heart, oh, now I'm like, heartfully, <laughs> and now I want to get the exact words that he used. Sorry. Pause and think about that. The children actually want names and they want reality and they want, you know, to fill their word hoard up with stories that are true. Tolkien was worried about how to get the Hobbit into the American audience. Um, and they were talking about some illustrations for the book. This is in 1937, uh, May 1937, before it was published. And he had his own drawings that he was suggesting maybe they could use. And he's, I, I, I'm changing my mind about his, his um, self-effacement, right? It's like, on the one hand, it seems, t quote, typically British to me. But on the other hand, maybe he wasn't, he really wasn't certain. And, and it's, it's excruciating to him. I'm not sure. But anyway, he's talking about how he... Um, he has some pictures, but maybe they won't be good, but maybe you can get another illustrator, but he knew which illustrations he didn't want. It might be advisable, rather than lose the American interest, to let the Americans do what seems good to them. As long as it was possible, I should like to add, to veto <laughs> anything from or influenced by the Disney Studios, for all whose works I have a heartfelt loathing. Tolkien absolutely loathed Disney and this never changed, right? There's there's a later letter where he's talking about, and I'm going to do this again, I did, I will mark everything beforehand and then I will still think of things that I, as I'm talking to tell you again. Um, there's a later 
again, it, it always comes down to the illustrations, and he really, really hated Tolkien, uh, liter uh, um, Disney illustrations, but he also hated what they did with the stories. He hated what they did to the fairy stories, and um, there's a, they're talking about a Germanic edition of the, a German edition of The Hobbit. They wanted more illustrations. Um, I continue to receive letters from poor Horace Ingalls about a German translation. This is in December 1946. He does not seem necessarily to pose himself as a translator. He has sent me some illustrations of the trolls in Gollum, which despite certain merits, such as one would expect of a German, are, I fear, too disnified for my taste. Bilbo with a dribbling nose, and Gandalf as a figure of vulgar fun rather than the Odinic wanderer that I think of. He hated Disney with, and, and hated, hated what Disney did with the stories throughout his life. Well, let's think a little bit about Disney. Um, Pinocchio, for example. Um, first uh, air uh, was shown in 1940, and um, I assume some of you may have watched a certain other professor's lectures on the Pinocchio story, and therefore maybe have been thinking about this, and I know Fox posted something a little while ago, uh, pictures from one the uh, the stills from the original movie, and you remember what happens to Pinocchio. And Pinocchio is the puppet, wants to be a real boy, but he's basically lured to Pleasure Island by its um, the the fox and the now forgotten cat. Right? Um, they they first get him to go. Um, I've forgotten all my names. I'm sorry. They go to the puppeteer who, in fact, basically kidnaps Pinocchio, takes the boys to Pleasure Island, um, you know, loads them up with drink and gambling, and they all turn into donkeys. Except for somehow Pinocchio manages, with the aid of his kind of conscience, Jiminy Cricket, to, to escape, finds out Geppetto, his maker father, has despaired, gone in search for him, ends up in the belly of a whale. Pinocchio makes the whale sneeze, and they um, that when the whale sneeze, they all get out of the whale, but Pinocchio dies, and because he's been finally um, unselfish in his helping of his father, rescuing his father from the underworld, he's given a, he's, he becomes real. Now, you might, that you could read this as virtuous, <laughs> right? That, in fact, what happens for Pinocchio is he's given a conscience and he finds himself in the real world rather than seduced by the the grooming of the cat and the fox to consider that debauching himself in vice is more fun than you know being a good boy so you could say well why wouldn't tolkien like this maybe 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 tolkien just didn't like the the style of disney but he does you know d does seem to suggest that there's there's actually more going on with the morality then, I mean, heartfelt loathing is not just pictures, right? There's something other in his sense of not just what fairy stories are going to be doing, but what children want. And if you take what I've been, been saying here, it's saying what children want is reality. I, I got on this Disney thing, one, because I was, I was sort of reading through the letters and thinking, you know, where does Tolkien talk about whether he's writing for children and he's not, and, you know, stumbled across this, reminding me that he hates, 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 Disney wants nothing to do with Disney and yet perpetually all of these critics are going to keep saying you know he's he's Disney like right Disney I'm certain you've heard over the years that you know Disney um kitchifies everything and makes everything palatable and easy and is you know simplistic in its good guys and bad guys and so yet again we should assume that Tolkien is either he's kidding himself or he sensed something in the Disney use of the stories that was deeply antithetical to what he wanted to accomplish. And I think where it, where it lands is in the sense of what the imagination is for, right? That we think of stories for children in the sort of horrible, kitschified, Disneyfied gloopiness <laughs> of modernity, as we we think of stories for children as you know, want, wanting to help them es escape, 
right? There's that, that you know, use your imagination, you know, find, find yourself living in a world with unicorns and um, fairies and dragons and such. And yet we are now living in a world <laughs> in which adults seem determined to turn themselves into fairies, right? All the different hair colors and um, I, I'm, I'm moderately aware of, of these things happening on online right now put on elf ears and get certain kinds of audiences and you know play the kinds of role-playing games that Iyer was pointing to the fans make their cult right cult i think here is a problem and what it is that we think the imagination is giving us access to is a problem and i think it must constantly go back to why Tolkien insisted over and over and over again that he was not writing for children. That he was, in fact, writing for adults and that fantasy was something that satisfied, not that satisfied, I mean, there, there's a satisfaction there, but there's, there's a kind of danger and troubling quality to the use of the imagination that he says, I mean, children, ch I mean, in fact, to say children are frightened or, or such, so much horror, you know, the Tsar movie, I just, I get, just got to watch it recently, which I hadn't seen before, and I've got some friends that suggested that we had to watch it, and I'm like, I'm never going to forget this, I'm never going to, this is awful. And you think, you know, that the, 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 what Pennywise wants to do is drag the children down into his clown horror and, and feed on them, and that that is all because it's Stephen King, a metaphor for the abuse that they're suffering, right? And that what I read, people like Wilson and Rissick and Iyer insisting on over and over and over again, saying that, you know, Tolkien's writing for Tol children, Tolkien's writing for children because he doesn't deal with these adult themes like sex, that they... Could it be they hate Tolkien because he's not, in fact, writing for children? He's not writing to seduce children. He's not writing to groom children. He's not writing to rob children of their innocence in the way that I am now utterly convinced that the Disney movies were designed to do and that makes them truly evil in a way that even Sauron would have difficulty matching. Now, in, I, what, there are lots of things that you know, we need to meditate on here about what the ring is and how, you know, what, what, what it means to be you know, desiring that kind of control over other wills. But if you consider that the thing that the ring does and the and the and the the hobbits who are able to resist it the great great evil is that abuse of rhetoric that persuasion that storytelling that draws you into not the reality in which you see the sun and the and the, the flowers and the stars and to go back to the um I'm sorry I've lost it the that the the dream of heaven in which Tolkien and Lewis lived right that for Rissick this description and it seemed to him that is as in his dream in the house of Bombadil the gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back and he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. You want to take this image of childlike stillness away from children? That's evil. And if you don't find that in Tolkien's stories overtly and you prefer literature 
that has that kind of invitation, that wants to lure you away from the vision of heaven? Well, I think we know who the enemy is now. So I planned, in fact, to end with the observation that it takes an adult to write a thousand page fairy story and to get us to be thinking about why adults tell stories about dragons. But that took me in a place that I hadn't quite planned. <laughs> and yet I think is the great power of the stories that Tolkien has told for us that if we allow ourselves to take them on, we will see much more deeply into the soul of modernity than we may ever want to be able to see. Till next time. Thank you for joining me. I am Professor Rachel Fulton Brown, and this is The Forge of Tolkien.